I'm delighted to be speaking to Ram Shankar today. Ram is an accomplished mechanical engineer who has graced the floor for TEDx talks and also acts as a, a mentor even to Silicon Valley companies. Ram, lovely to see you today. Lovely to be here, Dave. Thank you for having me. No, it's an absolute pleasure. We've had a, a, a pre-chat before we've started the interview and already yeah, I've got so much knowledge and information from you. I think it's going to be a very, very interesting conversation um, that we have. Um, one of the things we should really start from the beginning, I guess, and I know you wanted to talk about finding your, your, your niche in a market or a niche, as Americans would say. So, yeah, please tell me what, what advice would you give about finding your niche, Ram? Where we are today compared to where we were, let's say, 12 months ago, uh, nobody would have imagined uh, the situation. Now, the ongoing pandemic has changed the way we do a number of things, you know, like had it been the old world, for lack of a better phrase, Dave, you and I would be sat in a cafe, uh, having a coffee or sat in a pub, having a beer and talking about this. But what's happened now is I'm sat in Manchester and you sat in Kent and we're still being able to do this. Now that has required both of us to change the way we think about doing things, to realign our minds to a new way of doing things. Now, find your niche is more about helping people realign themselves to the changing order of doing things or, or work. And there are three elements to finding your niche. The first one is what I call crisis response. The second one is the SWOT. It's not a new thing. SWOT is the same strength, weakness, opportunities, and threats, but I'll come to it in a bit more detail. And the third one is called going from being product focused to solution focused. Now, the first thing when we talk about a crisis response is let's face it, we are in a crisis and therefore how we respond, how, how we identify a crisis and how we respond to a crisis situation is not only beneficial from our personal point of view, but it is something that people are going to look for whenever they're looking for their new employees or looking for somebody they want to recruit. So the first thing to understand is what a crisis is. So to define crisis in a very simple term, it is something that has a negative impact and something that's kind of going out of control. That's a very simple definition of crisis. Second thing, how do you identify a crisis? Now that takes a bit more of a, of a breaking down of a given situation. Now, if you think something is a crisis, the question you need to ask yourself is, why is something a crisis? Then you start pointing towards the various things that are going on in a given situation, all of which are having a negative impact. And then you can start putting lines in the sense like the current situation is a crisis because of this, this and this. Now, for example, the ongoing pandemic is a crisis because it's a virus, it's deadly and it spreads from person to person. Therefore, people cannot meet, cannot go to work, cannot travel, things like that. So once you start identifying the reasons why something is a crisis, then you can you have three options. Number one, you can control absolutely nothing. Number two, you can control certain bits. Number three, you can control a lot of the things. Now, regardless of what happens, your objective is what is the best outcome under the given situation? That's the question you need to ask yourself. Now, you're not looking for utopia, you're not looking for the yellow brick road, you're looking for the best outcome under a given situation. For some people, it might simply be paying your bills every month and trying to stay relevant in the current times. For some other people, it might just be, you know, not being made redundant, being on furlough and not being made redundant. So nobody knows. And this best situation under best outcome under the current situation is different for different people. So once you identify that, what you need to do is list out the things that you can do to achieve that best possible outcome under the given situation and just go about doing it. The most important thing to remember is worrying may not, well, not may not, will not help because there are two reasons you shouldn't be worrying. Number one, if you're able to do something about the situation, there's absolutely no need to worry because you can go ahead and do it. The second reason is, will worrying help? No, worrying will not help. Therefore, no matter how much you worry, if a situation is out of your control, you can do nothing to bring the situation back to control. Therefore, there is no point in worrying. I admit it's easier said than done, 
but it is possible to do it. it takes a bit of practice but it can be done the second thing is we spoke about swat now the way i look at it swat is strength weakness opportunity and threat i say ignore the opportunity and the threat bit because those things are external to yourself and you do not control them you do not control when opportunities arise you do not control when threats arise and how to counter the th- or or what the impact of threats can be but what you can definitely control is your strengths and your weaknesses now what i would do is i would take a sheet of paper on and start listing out all the strengths that you think you have and i would list out all the weaknesses you think you have now what i would do is compare your strengths and your weaknesses with a similar list that you probably would have made a few years ago or maybe not but go back to a time let's say maybe even a year or so ago where and and then write down the list of strengths and weaknesses you had back then and then do a comparison if you've not done in the past keep this list with you and do exactly the same thing in a year's time and you should notice that your strengths have increased but you will notice that your weaknesses have changed now the reason i say your weaknesses have changed is because that shows that you are growing as a person you probably didn't know something 6 months ago but you know how to do it well so you've grown now as a consequence of that growth you are trying to learn new things which you do not know how to do now and those become your weaknesses your old weaknesses get replaced by new weaknesses which is a sign of learning so you need to do that maybe every 6 months or every year and then you will see yourself growing as a person now the reason you need to do it is if i asked you one question which is if i took away all your titles if i took away all your achievements if i took away all your academic qualifications what are you at the core of your being this strength and weakness matrix that you prepare will define who you are as a person you don't have to be a cxo you don't have to be a managing director or or an or a director of any sort what it is that is core to you is what this strengths and weakness analysis will will help you identify that brings me to the next point about find your niche which is to go from product focused to becoming solutions focused i'm sure all of you remember a time when we all used to be able to go on a holiday you know we all used to jump on a flight well we used to jump on a taxi get to the airport jump on a flight and go and and sit on a sunny beach somewhere and sip cocktails now before you get to the beach to sip on your cocktails there is a number of things that are absolutely necessary your taxi to the airport your check in desk security checkups the crummy little cramped seat the 4 or 3 hour flight to your destination checking in at the hotel and all of that all those things are absolutely necessary but how many of us are thinking about all these things versus how many of us are thinking about actually sipping that cocktail on the beach i would i can confidently say all of us think about what we want which is to sip the cocktails on the beach rather than what we need which is the entire process before we can do that the point i'm trying to make here is you need to position yourself as something your future employers or your future business partners want as opposed to what they need they may need all the skills you have they may need all the experience you have but unless you project yourself as something or someone they want then you're not going to cut any mustard you're not going to make any inroads you're not going to make any ground now how do you do that suppose you come and tell me oh you have all these skills or oh, i am a cxo i am a cfo i have these many ex- years of experience in in doing finance activities i have an mba from harvard now when you tell me all this supposing i ask you the question so what that's all i need to ask you when you tell me everything i tell you so what how are you going to respond to that question of so what that's what you need to think about and focus on how do you change the conversation from being product focused which is focusing on yourself and going to solutions focused which is focusing on how you're going to make life better for the other person so these three elements are what i call finding your niche or niche if you're american yeah but well, it's very much i was actually reading something very similar um a, f- a few days ago um in in the people often start with the actual what the problem is as opposed to the actual the solution they almost they look for the solution for the product so they've had a great idea for a product but then they have to think about the solution but they actually got a op- completely the opposite way around what's the problem then build it around the problem um and that's a, a yeah. one of the major stumbling blocks for um startups 
Um, it's just fascinating to actually, you know, hear that being corroborated. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's a thought train, isn't it? I think really. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it's a train of thought. Absolutely. And I agree with you. Yeah. So, um, well, so yeah. You, you, you've come with your, your idea. We found, um, we got a solution to a problem that we've, we, we've encountered or we've seen encountered by other people. We then have to come up with a, a product, which may be a physical product or it may be uh, a digital product. A term or an acronym that's thrown around at the moment is the MVP. Um, perhaps you'd like to explain what an MVP is and some pitfalls and some advantages of it. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, MVP. Uh, where do I begin? Uh, I begin at the end. You know, that's how you develop your product uh, or you start your product design process. You, when I say you start at the end, what I mean is you need to determine and decide what it is that you want at the end of all your effort. So once your goal is clearly defined, then the start of the process is a lot easier. Now, coming to the whole minimum viable product alone, or MVP as people call it, uh, we need to remember that it has three words, minimum, viable, and product. Second thing to remember is the word viable is the middle word. Typically, like the middle child syndrome, the word viable gets forgotten. Everyone is so keen on developing an MVP that they forget the V bit and they only focus on the minimum and the product. Uh, 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 an extremely common and well-known example that's floating around on the internet is, is this is chart that shows you, or you have a skateboard, then you have a scooter, then you have a bicycle, then you have a motorcycle, and then you have a car, and that's how you build an MVP. No, that's not how you build an MVP. What they're showing there is five different products. A skateboard is not a scooter, is not a bicycle, is not a motorcycle, is not a car. They are different products. A better way to look at MVP is, you know, I spoke about the airlines earlier, is airline seats. You know, an economy class seat is an MVP. Why is it an MVP? It's minimum, it's viable, and it's a product. It, it, may, it meets all the stipulated requirements in terms of regulations and law. B, it provides somebody uh, seating over the duration of the flight. C, it has all the safety features such as your seat belts, your oxygen masks, your flotation device under the seat, and all of that. And D, it meets the minimum regulations in terms of what leg room and head room and, and side room and seat width you need to have. So that's a minimum viable product. Once you successfully build an economy seat that works and doesn't break down during a flight, then you upgrade on it by adding a few more features like a premium economy with a bit more seat width, with a bit more leg room, and so on and so forth. Now, the next stage of the product is the business class, which is an upgrade on the premium economy. Again, a bit more privacy, a bit more seat room, extra features, fine dining. And then you have the next level of the product, which is first class, which is you know completely close. I mean, if you're flying on one of the Middle Eastern airlines like Emirates, the first class is like a little room, you know, it's like it's like a little room you have for yourself. And then the next upgrade is what people call uh, the residence which is literally uh, perhaps a, a, a studio apartment for yourself in the sky. Now, that's how you build a minimum viable product. Start with something that actually does what it is supposed to do in terms of functionality, in terms of regulatory compliance, in terms of uh, what I call as buyability, which is people will actually want to buy and use, and of course, user friendliness. Once you've achieved what your basic or the minimum iteration of your product has done based on, you know, I told you earlier to start at the end. Yep. So it has to meet all the functional requirements of the end product, but it has to be absolutely, that's all it, that's all it should be. You don't have anything else to it. And once you have a successful working model, then you build all these add-ons. That's how you build an MVP. You don't go from a skateboard to a scooter, to a bicycle, to a motorcycle, to a car. You're building five different products that way. So think about the, the airline seat, going from economy to the residence. That's the way you would build an MVP. Uh, I hope that makes it uh, a bit clearer now. Oh, I mean, totally wrong. I mean, that's an absolutely a great analogy. When actually, I'm going to actually use that going forward um, when I'm explaining to people, because I mean, this website, the moment we speak here, we're 25 days into the actual um, website. 
and yeah we got I got it to an MVP and you know every day almost I'm making some improvements to it or and taking advice uh, and just making it a little bit better, a little more user friendly, having more features or changing some design elements. Um, but yeah, I, I actually had it up on day one, January the 1st, day after I had the idea to set the, 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 the site up and we were there. Um, and yeah, it, it's just definitely the way to go. If I was analyzing overall, the site would still be not even going at the moment. I'd still be, oh, I've got to change this shade of blue. I've got to do that. And I've got to do some focus groups. I've got to do this, I've got to do that. I mean, the important thing is, you know, you don't want to spend thousands upon thousands of, of, of pounds, especially if you're manufacturing something, you have to get a, a proof of concept, you know, get it to that MVP, get proof of concept at the MVP level, and then you can start thinking about how, how you can make it better um, going forward. I'm very lucky it's a website, so my investment was, was, was time. Um, now, it's very interesting as a mechanical engineer in your business um, journey, Ron, you've worked with some illustrious organizations and companies, one of them, for instance, being the European Space Agency. How does that come about and how do you get to deal with the European Space Agency? Uh, that came about, that was an absolute stroke of fortune, because in one of my earlier jobs, uh, I used to work with this guy and a part of the engineering team. Uh, who ended up working for what is called as UK Research and Innovation, UKRI, who are part of the European Space Agency's supply chain, and they look after all the UK contributions to uh, the ESAS programs. And they wanted to do some uh, structural integrity analysis. And this friend of mine calls me up and asks, do you want to do some of this work? I said, yeah, why not? So what's it for? He said, oh, it's part of the ESA, the European Space Agency's um, Copernicus satellite program and they want to do some analysis on some ground support equipment, things that are going to a vacuum chamber. I said, yeah, why not? Who wouldn't want to do this? And like, yeah, let's do something about it. So this happened towards the end of 2016, did a couple of projects for them. And then in early 2017, we got a couple of big contracts to help develop the mechanical and thermal designs for some of this equipment that goes into the vacuum chamber somewhere in Oxfordshire to do some testing and measurement of instrumentation. And we were able to deliver those two projects for them over a period of uh, 18 to 20 months. And that's how we got into it. And uh, yeah, it's been a fascinating experience. It's been uh, amazing. It's been uh, an experience where, you know, engineering for me is something that comes so close to making a real impact in people's lives. The other profession perhaps being, being a doctor or being a teacher, but engineering uh, for me is, is personal. For example, uh, I've got this piece of uh, valve in my hands uh, that I hope you can all see. And this is a valve that we developed for a customer uh, some time ago, which actually helps prevent death by choking when somebody is breathing using a ventilator. Now, this has got no sensors or electronics. It works purely on the principles of fluid mechanics. And this prototype was literally 3D printed using the printer behind me that you see there. I was going to ask you what that was. I've been intrigued. Yeah, so that's a 3D printer, which is a very basic 3D printer. And as you can see, given the pandemic, I'm working from a makeshift office, which is uh, one of the rooms in the house. So the 3D printers moved here. And we've designed everything using the 3D modeling software and the prototype was basically built using the 3D printer and it was hand assembled literally in this house. So yeah, engineering gives me the opportunity to make a real difference uh, to, to the world that we live in, which is why the punchline for my company is called a better engineered world, uh, if that makes sense. So you came with that product. So it actually perhaps ties into the, the you know your previous comments. So why did you think of that product? Where, where did that come from? You, you saw the problem was there. So you went about finding the solution or you, how, how did it work? So we were given the problem to say, look, this is what we want to try and do. There are a number of valves that will do this job, but we want a valve that will work with smaller diameter tubes when they're inserted into the, into the windpipe, into the lungs. So we came up with a number of ideas. We came up with, I think, 35 to 40 different concepts all, most of which could do the job, but then some of them were too complicated, unnecessary, uh, extra, extra large, too much material, too many little components and devices. And we decided what is the bare minimum we need to, to make this thing work? 
we need something that will detect what the pressure in the lungs is. I'm sorry if I'm getting a bit technical, but we need to detect something when someone is gasping or when someone is coughing. Then based on whether someone is gasping or coughing, it has to let air in or let air out. That's all we need. So what do we need? We need a tube. We need some pressure. We need a spring and we need a bung that will activate the spring. And we need some end caps to allow the air passage. Once we decided that's what we need, the rest of the process became fairly straightforward rather than complicate things with electronics and sensors and what have you. That's really good, um, Ram. Very, very insightful. We're going to wrap it up now for the, the YouTube and our non-community members. For our members, we're actually going to carry on chatting, a couple of points to discuss. You can join um, business questions on the website. It's only £50 per year. You get ad-free interviews and extended interviews with a lot of insight and in, in knowledge. So hopefully we're, we're, we'll see you there. And thank you very much, Ram. Just before we carry on chatting to Ram, I wanted to thank you all for being a member of the site. It's allowing us to grow, develop the site, and also give us the funds to, to pay for app development, which we really, really want to, want to start getting rolling out there as soon as we can. And it also helps enhance the website and the viewer experience for you. So thank you very much indeed. I know Ram wanted to um, speak about a particular subject. So I'm just going to let, hand over to Ram and let him chat you and introduce it to you. Ram. So what I want to talk about today is, is, is a statement that is attributed to the famous Italian mathematician Archimedes. So Archimedes once told the king that give me a place to stand on and give me a lever and a fulcrum and I will move the world. Now what he was talking about is, is, in, is, is, is about pure physics, but what he said in those days is quite relevant to a number of organizations even today. Now there are four distinct elements to this statement that he made. The first one is the person who's going to move the world. In the quote, it is Archimedes, but in, in your organization, in your context, it is the people who make things happen within an organization, the people who are the movers, the people who make decisions happen, the people who essentially make everything happen, who are the influential people in your organization. The next part of the quote uh, from Archimedes is a place to stand on. Now, this doesn't just refer to a physical place or a geographic location, but it more it refers more to where are these people in the organizational hierarchy? Where are these people in terms of the decision-making process? And where are these people in terms of whether or not they have the people's ears and whether they have the backing of the people around them or not? The third thing, uh, the third part of this quote is the lever. The lever is the tool that is used to move the world. So lever in this case is what are the tools, the technologies, the, the, the equipment and the infrastructure and the facilities your people, your movers are provided to, to make things happen. And finally, we talk about the fulcrum, which is essential for the tool to be applied with. Without a fulcrum, the tool cannot do anything. So the fulcrum refers to the support the fulcrum refers to the surrounding network or the support network or the approval of the people that they have in order to make this happen. So in order to become a, a more effective organization, you need to identify who your movers are. You need to identify where they stand. You need to identify what levers have you given them to do this, to make things happen. And finally, you need to identify what are the fulcrums you give them in order for them to be uh, at their uh, most efficient and effective uh, way of doing things for you. So remember Archimedes, give me a place to stand on, a lever and a fulcrum, and I will move the world. So ask yourself who your people are who will do this for you, and how can you enable them to do that? Now, that's really, really solid advice, I think, Ram. And one we can actually, I think we all work, you know, it's the old analogy, where we work you know, in our businesses, not on our businesses. And sometimes we need to actually, see, a hotelier, they need to actually still get out the office and actually walk around the hotel and experience it as a guest to see how things work and change their, 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 their thought trade and how they look at the hotel. Um, so that, that's really, really beneficial. I know also you, um, you mentioned previously about sustainability in, in, in business. If you've got just a few more moments just to go over a little over, overview of sustainability and why it's so important. Yeah, absolutely, Dave. I mean, sustainability for me uh, has uh, 
is, is quite a personal thing for me as well, because sustainability in one word refers to the future of our planet. And it became an extremely personal thing for me when my daughter was born four months ago. So for me, sustainability is not just talking about things. It's about leaving the planet in a way in which she can live happily, she can survive, thrive and prosper and ask and her kids and their kids. Therefore, it's important for us to focus on, on, on the planet. Now, how, how do we do sustainability? You know, it's, it's a common question everybody has. We either take a bunch of placards and stand outside a big building and, and, and indulge in activism, or we can take concrete action to bring sustainability into our lives. Now, more often than not, when we talk about sustainability, our, our conversation is limited to recycling, waste management, and clean energy, which is great. But the problem with recycling and waste management is it is at the end of a product's life cycle. For example, if I were to talk about recycling and waste management with regards to this valve, what I would tell people is you will need to dispose of this valve in a manner it cannot go into a landfill and so on and so forth. But if I tell you that you can get bigger benefits on sustainability if you lead the design with sustainability built into it. Now, supposing if I tell you that this valve is designed to be a multi-use valve, if this valve is designed to operate across a number of pressures, and this valve is easy to disassemble, clean, sterilize, and reuse, and this valve can also be used not just in the healthcare sector, but as a pressure relief valve elsewhere, by design, this valve fulfills a number of uses by the nature of how we've developed it. So the idea is sustainability has to start with design, which is at the beginning of the product life cycle. And the idea is to design waste out so that you don't have to recycle, you don't have to manage waste. The second thing about clean energy is fantastic. We need clean energy, but by bringing sustainability-led design, not only can we do the clean energy bit, but we can get more for the clean energy that we are generating. Your energy bills or your energy usage gives you more bang for your buck. So sustainability is about the overall, oops. It's, it's about the, the sustainability is about the overall picture, not just little elements here and there. And the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals provide us with a beautiful set of 17 guidelines or sustainable development goals that serve as a, as a guiding mechanism for us to practice sustainability. Fantastic. Yeah, I think it is so, so important, isn't it? Especially in the product manufacturer, it has to be, built into the actual in, into the process um, i was just watching david attenborough on the, the planet program yesterday um yes yeah i mean his program's absolutely you know, amazing but with the ice caps melting and ocean plastic we just have to yeah single use just has to become a thing of the, the past so it's great to see that you know the valve you develop that single purpose actually has multiple uses and is actually reusable can be um can be sterilized i'm sure in the past that would have just been completely disregarded and it would have been a single use um, product and probably multiple times for the same patient. So, you know, that's absolutely brilliant. And let's just hope so many people follow your, follow your suit, Ram, and, and, and get that message um, across to the world and, and, and work in an environmentally friendly practice. Uh, thank you so much for your, your, your time. We're going to put all the links to your, your website below. Um, but perhaps you just like to say, where, where, how can people find you, Ram? Uh, people can find me through my website, which is ram.work. Uh, people can find me on my Twitter, uh, ram underscore S13. And just look me up on LinkedIn as well. Uh, ram Shankar is the name you look for. And yeah, I'm, I'm quite uh, available on all forms of social media. So. Oh, that's absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, really, really appreciate your, your, your time, Ram. I've, I've learned a lot. Thank you.